we have roughly 18 minutes together to talk about new beginnings. Now, 18 minutes seems like kind of a strange amount of time, so I was trying to put it in proper perspective, and I found this interesting statistic. Apparently, the current world record for someone holding their breath is a little over 19 minutes. So imagine holding your breath for the whole length of my presentation. <laughs> I'm not suggesting this. In fact, please don't try it. I don't want you to risk fainting. Um, but it does make us start to think about what are the limits of things that we can do? What are the possibilities? So one thing I would like to ask you to do is this. Please look under your seats for a moment as some of you will find a surprise there, a, a pink and white bag. If you did, if you did, then you can take it out, but don't open it. This bag is much more than a gift. It's in fact part of a game that I will ask you to play. But I will explain this later. So for now, just take it out. So the topic I'd like to talk to you about is this idea of reclaiming our imagination. What does that mean? What does it mean to reclaim it? What is it good for? And how do we go about doing it? Let me first ask, is there any children in the audience? Any children at all? Oh, I see, I see. So, right, well, then you know my follow-up question. If, in fact, all of us are adults, do we look at ourselves as adults? Or are we a little bit uncertain whether we are fully grown up and leaving our childhood behind or not. So if I ask the question differently, are there any of us who are physically adults but feel also that they're children? That's better, excellent. Because that's really the direction that I like to take this discussion. Because I think that perspective holds great promise, great potential. All around in the world today, we see a need for greater creativity, a call for greater creativity, whether it's in business, whether it's in education, politics, environmental activism, or in our personal lives. Because we're facing such complex problems, such unprecedented situations, we don't quite know how to deal with them. So the question then becomes, what is the source of this greater creativity that we crave? And I think that the answer is very, very simple. It's within each one of us. Because when we were children, we were by nature incredibly imaginative, creative. We were exploring all the time. And that essence of ourselves gets covered up as we age. And by the time we become adults, most of us, most of us accept the fact that we need to leave our childish self behind. And our thinking becomes much more regimented, much more controlled, much more in line with others, much more boring even. So a shortcut to greater creativity, in fact, our own personal resource lies with this idea of reconnecting with our childhood self. So let me start this thinking process by giving you two quick examples. One is a well-known example about Archimedes, the Greek mathematician from ancient Greece, and of course, the, the famous story goes that he was sitting in a bathtub and he was preoccupied by this problem, namely how to make sure that a crown prepared for a king was made of pure gold or not. And in his bathtub, he had this moment of illumination. He had this whole new way all of a sudden of looking at the problem. And he was so excited by this discovery that he ran out in the streets without any clothes on and yelled, Eureka, I got it, I got it. When we were children, we had eureka moments all the time. In fact, that's how we started to make sense out of the world. So my second story, which is a bit less well-known, is about my childhood, or at least one incident within my childhood that was told to me by my parents. Apparently, this happened when I was about a year and a half old, and I was playing with matchboxes and pushing them around on a coffee table. And suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, a fly caught my attention, perhaps for the first time. And I reached out to touch it, and the fly disappeared. So my immediate reaction was to look under the table to see exactly where it has fallen. 
Of course, I didn't find it. The fly flew back. Same thing happened, looked again, and this cycle continued for two or three iterations until at one point the fly disappeared. I did not look under the table, but looked around and I noticed the fly on the wall or on a piece of furniture. Think about that moment, how remarkable it is in one sense, because what happened? My understanding of the world was just shattered in that moment. The way that I made sense of things was challenged. Yet, very importantly, I was receptive to that. And on the other hand, how commonplace these moments were. Because perhaps daily, perhaps even more frequently, we had these moments as children. This is how we learned. Now ask yourself this, when was the last time that you had a Eureka moment? Was it in the last week, last month, last year? When were you so inspired by a completely new way of looking at things, by an illumination of, of a situation or a problem that you were dealing with that, that you suddenly saw differently, that you just had to run out of the streets without any clothes on and yell, Eureka, I got it. So let's now uh, look at what some of the greatest minds are saying about this issue, about the progression from childhood to adulthood and what happens in the change of the way that we think and we look at the world. Picasso said this, every child is an artist. The problem is to remain an artist as we grow up. Another artist, Dr. Seuss, who is this great American illustrator and writer of children's books, goes even further. This is what he says. Adults are just obsolete children. What a wonderful twist on progression. What he's saying, in essence, is not that children are being groomed to become adults, but we have it backwards. It's adults that should be worried about staying connected to their childhood essence. Well, how about some of the more analytic minds, people who have contributed greatly to science or practical things? Well, firstly, let's take Albert Einstein, the father of modern physics. What did he say about this? This is what he said. He said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Imagination encircles the world. How about Thomas Edison, who was named the world's greatest inventor? He had over a thousand patents to his name. He invented, amongst other things, a typewriter, the light bulb, motion picture camera, phonograph, the uh, central power generator, the iPad, <laughs> maybe not that, maybe not that, but certainly a lot of things. And he was once asked by a reporter who said, Mr. Edison, you being the greatest inventor ever, what do you consider to be the world's greatest invention? And what do you think he said? Without hesitation, this is what he replied. A child's imagination, that's where it all starts. So let's now take this a little bit further. And if we're starting to make the case that we need to reconnect with our imagination that's actually inside us, but just dormant, or just below the adult way of looking at things that, that's, that's pushing it down, if we reconnect with it, how can we specifically make use of it? What is it allowing us to do? And I think the answer to that is this. It allows us to continue to ask the what if questions. Continue to see opportunities where others see limitations. This is the new beginning that I like to explore with you. And it allows us to defy conventional wisdom, meaning not to accept the artificial barriers that others have set in front of us or before us of what we can and cannot do. And here's an observation that Steve Forbes made, who is a major publisher and editor. And a couple of years ago, he was working on a book in which he explored the similarities in great leaders from ancient times and, and modern uh, business leaders. And this is, what he, this is one of the observations from his project that he thought was most profound. And that is, if you look back through history, most often, the greatest accomplishments happen when someone dared to defy conventional wisdom, dared to do something that others didn't think can happen, should happen, was possible. And that is the link
for this idea of reclaiming our imagination. So think back in history, and, and I'm sure you can think of, of your examples. Here are a couple of my favorites. Certainly the Trojan horse is this universal symbol of unconventional thinking from the military sphere. Who is this runner on this picture? This is Roger Bannister. What did he do in 1954? He was the first man who ran a mile under four minutes. So he's the first man to break the four minute barrier. And why is this significant? Because up to that point, it was widely regarded that it was physically impossible to do that, that humans are not built in a way to run that fast. But after he did it, within 10 years, 300 other people also broke the four minute barrier, proving that this was a psychological barrier, not a physical one. How about this third uh, picture here? This young child, young boy, who is this? This is the Hungarian physicist Ignaz Semmelweis. Now what did he do? He came up with this refreshingly simple solution to a terrible problem in the mid 19th century. And that problem was child or in infant mortality, which was ravaging new babies. And what Dr. Semmelweis observed and discovered is that the solution was as simple as the doctors washing their hands, disinfecting the bacteria that they were carrying when they were treating young babies, bringing it in from other parts of the hospital, even from, from cadavers. And even though Dr. Semmelweis is regarded as a medical pioneer who's credited with saving multitudes of children, he was ridiculed in his time by his colleagues and his peers. Why? They dismissed his solution, even though it worked, and they saw its results because it was just too simple, too simplistic, and it did not fit with their way of looking at medicine. And how about this last example, Apollo 11, when we're talking about using our imagination. President John F. Kennedy, in 1961, had a vision, and he said, within 10 years, before the end of this decade, we will get a man to the moon. Now, he had no basis in reality to say this. The technology was not there, but he had a vision, and he shared that vision with others, and his imagination and his, his motivation, enthusiasm, carried everyone else to really kick their creativity into high gear and make it happen. And in the summer of 1969, the first man did land on the moon. So let's not take it a little bit further and bring it to current times. In fact, looking at the business sphere and business leadership. I think Mohammed Yunus is one of the true pioneers of this new direction called social capitalism. The idea that you can do good business at the same time with doing social good. And so he established this bank in Bangladesh called the Grameen Bank and proved and demonstrated that you can lend money to the poorest of one of the poorest countries in the world and kindle in them entrepreneurship in a way that you don't use security. You don't ask them to leave something with you in case they default because they have nothing to give. But he proved that this was both profitable and sustainable. And in 2006, he received the Nobel Peace Prize, along with the bank he founded for this very reason. And look at what he says. He says that his greatest challenge as a visionary, as a pioneer, has to do with the mindset of others, because our mindset, our minds, tell our eyes what to see. It's all controlled right there. Last year, IBM did a major study. They asked 1,500 CEOs around the world what they thought was the single most important quality they need to possess to be a successful leader going forward. What do you think the number one answer was? It was this, creativity, which even to me was surprising that business leaders would put that ahead of some other more analytical qualities. 
But this is again the same cry out for creativity I mentioned earlier, realizing that our environment, our surroundings are so complex that it's not about doing what I did in the past better or more. It's about the flexibility of thought and entertaining new ways of looking at things, just like in my example with the fly. The notion of connecting creativity to strategy and to leadership is something that is of significant personal uh, interest to me. And so over the last two years, I've developed a framework that links them so that there's a systematic way when CEOs or business leaders or any organizational leaders are saying, we need to be more creative to allow them to be that way. And there's only two things I'd like you to notice on this chart, which shows the, the main points of this, of this framework. One is the shape and the name of it, slingshot. Slingshot is one of the most universal symbols of a simple childhood game that we would pick up and play with and use our imagination to become a hunter or a fighter or a knight or a protectress of treasure. And the other thing is, take note the positioning of this ingredient of defying conventional wisdom. Number three on this chart. It's right in the middle of it all. That's how important I think it is. The idea and the ability to have flexibility of thought, to see possibilities where others see barriers, and not accept artificial limitations of what is possible. I think it's the engine of this entire process. All right. So you've been very patient, especially those of you holding those bags that you don't know what to do with. So let me uh, explain what they're all about. So, so far I have made the case that we need to re-engage, reclaim our imagination. It's a wonderful resource we all have. So the question is how? How can we do it? And instead of just telling you or even showing you, I'd like you to experience it. So those of you that have received the bag, and there's a few others outside, <clears throat> for those of you that didn't but want to participate, what this bag is is really what I call an imagination kit. And in a sense, you are being asked to be the imagination ambassadors of this conference. And inside those imagination kits, you will find a few random everyday objects. And the game is, and the challenge is, for you to look at these objects and create the most fun game that you can out of them. And you will have an opportunity to do this right after all the presentations, during the reception. And there's wonderful prizes, worldwide fame on the line. So I encourage you to, uh, to try it out. And of course, the others who are not playing, observe. See what this, what this process does. It's, it's a wonderful thing. I've done this many times with very serious executives, and within minutes, they melt back to their childhood essence. So think about what I'm asking you to do. Yes, the idea of taking random objects and creating a game out of them, regarding them as toys, is what we did as children. It was very natural to us. So by asking you to do this now, you are making that reconnection. But let's go a little bit deeper. If we do go a little deeper, then we realize the following. Taking everyday common objects and making them into a game is the exact same thinking process that we need in order to look at our environment, look at our surroundings, look at all our resources and see them from a new perspective, a new dimension, assign them new value, new meaning. So I invite you to reclaim your imagination, to allow your inner child and your adult self to coexist, because I think the combination of those two is not only fun, meaningful, but deeply, deeply, deeply engaging. Thank you very much.